uh, Wings, etc. We are. Mm-hmm. I'm here with JJ Fabini. Hello. JJ, you're the program director at XKE. That's correct. And then you're the operations manager for the Fort Wayne cluster of Adams Radio Group. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, what does an operations manager do? Uh, I'm just basically responsible for um, all the program directors. Uh, they report to me, and I report then to the general manager of the company. Uh, the general manager oversees the entire building. Uh, I'm responsible for the technical and programming side of things. And then there's a director of sales who is responsible for all the salespeople and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, so that's what that's that's my gig. Now you're also yeah. program director at XKE. That's correct, yes. Now XKE is classic rock. Right. Now you must have been playing the same stuff that you were playing when I was in high school. So what basically is the, So what's the program director doing? Well, I mean, uh, on, on the day to day, you know, I, I run the music schedules, I uh, do all the specialty programming stuff that we do, you know, pick the themes for the lunch stuff that Doc does and uh, uh, do the, the musical research on that, um, you know, putting together those themes and stuff, and then um, uh, responsible for putting together all of our promotions, uh, appearances, events, assigning talent to go to all of that stuff, uh, helping the sales department with uh, anything that we do on the air to give them packages to be able to uh, uh, gain sponsorship for things along those lines. Uh, lots of meetings with community people. I'm responsible for all of our community outreach that we do. Um, any um, sort of uh, public service that the radio station is involved in is all uh, under my purview as well, which we do a lot of that stuff. Um, and that's really one of the biggest parts of, of the gig is is, uh, is is being in the community. That's that's one of our biggest things. And so we have a great partner in Sweetwater, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and and do everything we can to uh, to get involved with their public outreach as well. So there's a lot of that stuff that goes on all the time. And uh, that's it, you know. And uh, it makes for some long days, but it's worth it, I think. Well, yeah, yeah that makes for some long days. And then you're also, <laughs> yeah. uh, also on, on air. air, yeah, uh, on the air too in the afternoons, yeah. That's the thing about radio, man. It's 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 no longer a singular job workplace. Um, which, I mean, just like any other industry, you know, you're you're given more responsibilities than you would have had 20 years ago uh, due to um, automation and computers. Computers are both the greatest and worst thing that has happened to many industries, you know what I mean? Uh, Where you're able to streamline your operation, you can do things a little bit easier, but unfortunately that means that you can do it with less bodies, uh, which, you know, I don't like, but that's just the reality of the situation. I wish that I could have, um, you know, 17 people working on the radio station, like back in the old days, and, you know, a stable of 10 different part-timers to fill in people and stuff like that, but it's just not the reality anymore, because with the advent of um, being able to uh, record things in advance, since you can do that, oh, the wings just got here, Um, (laughs) since you can do that, um, now, you know, here's a perfect example. Uh, with uh, Doc West going on vacation next week, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I would do everything I could, and I, I still do, to, 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 I've got a couple of people that can fill in for me from time to time, mm-hmm. um, and I would, you know, reach out to them, but unfortunately, both the people that are on my uh, fill-in roster aren't available next week, mm-hmm. and all that means is that that work just goes to myself and Jason, our other uh, jock, the night guy, you've met Jason before, yeah. and... That means that we'll just cover for things, you know. Uh, does that mean that Jason's going to be live in the studio from 4 p.m. until midnight? You know, no. You know, he'll he'll be live in the studio until eight or nine, and then he'll be able to record the last you know portion of his shift, and you know that's just how things are done. Now. Well, yeah, I heard you on the way here. Right, exactly. I, I mean, you're my you're last out, half hour. You're out there thumping Billy Idol. Yep, yep. But then I come in here. But and I, was, I was already sitting here having yeah. a beer. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, now, yeah. how does that feel regarding or, or compared to the way it used to be? Because I remember when I worked at the newspaper. Oh yeah. You must used to have me in on the edge Absolutely. in the morning yeah. live. We're oh, yeah. actually there. Yeah. But yeah. now. I'm hearing you on the air, but you're here. Well, just most, tell me how that feels to you, just in terms of just how the industry's changed. Well, that, I think it says it all about how the industry's changed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because you do have the ability to do that. Now, what that has done for the industry as a whole, and if you look at the iHeart model, which is really you know the company that started everything when they were Clear Channel, um, and when everything was deregulated, and they said, oh, we can go buy a gazillion radio stations. Mm-hmm. Uh, what that did was that brought larger talent to smaller markets. Okay, mm-hmm. so you've got people that are working in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, you know, all the, all the big markets who are all of a sudden be able to farm out their programs to smaller markets. So um, 
the good part about that is you get really talented guys who are funny or extremely knowledgeable about music talking about you know that stuff on your radio station. The bad part about that is is that you lose a little bit of that local flavor, which I think is essential to local radio operation. Because if you don't serve your community, then what's the point? And so that's why we do everything that we possibly can to do as many community events and serve the community the best as we possibly can. Uh, we have to do it with a smaller staff, and that's just the reality of the situation. Every radio station is that way these days. But we get the job done. Now, you know? when, you, when you're talking about um, sort of the downsizing that's going on in radio. It's been going on for a long time. Right. Yeah. Now, um, your CEO, the CEO of Adams Radio Group, yeah. um, Ron Stone, he's thrilled to have a guy like you on staff. I think that I'm, you know, I think the reason is, you know, as with any job, with any place of employment, if you're a business owner, um, you're going to run into employees who don't really care mm -hmm. a lot, you know, they're there for a paycheck, and then you're going to run into employees who do care mm -hmm. and, you know, try to go above and beyond, and I try to be that latter mm -hmm. person, you know what I mean? That's It's a personal choice, and I think that it, it helps with longevity in the industry. I've been lucky enough to never have to move away from Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, some people would say, you know, well, you're an idiot for not moving away from Fort Wayne. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I grew up here. My parents are here. My family's here. You know, I mean, it, it, so it, I like it here. It's cheap. It's easy to live in Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. You know, if I were if I were living in a big market, uh, I, I'd have to worry about you know driving an hour to get to work. I don't have to worry about that here. I have to worry about paying you know an exorbitant amount of money to live in an apartment or own a home. In, in some cities, you can't even afford to own a home. You just can't. If you live in San Francisco, you know you got to be pulling down three or four hundred thousand dollars a year just mm -hmm. to buy a house. And that's obviously not the case here. It's an easy place to be. And so I, 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 I'm I, thinking I'm lucky with that, and I don't want to lose that opportunity. And, you know, working in radio and dealing with situations where they hand over ownership, you know, from one owner to the next, you know, I've been through four or five of those things. And any time that it happens, you always get a little nervous, but then I say, you know what? I'm just going to work my butt off. I'm going to make sure that my new employer knows what kind of employee I am. And... I think I'll be able to retain my job, and I've always been able to. Well, let me read what CEO Ron Stone said about you in All Access. Uh -huh. This is May 29th, 2014, mm -hmm. All Access M Music Group. Yep. It says, you don't find talent like J.J. often these days. Our industry has done an amazing job of eliminating tenure, right. and it's a shame. Yeah. But then he went on to talk about how he's thrilled to have a guy like you on board. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just letting you know this month, giving you love. Well, you know, I appreciate everything that he says, obviously. You know, I, you know, I don't get to work with Ron very closely anymore. I did for a little while uh, when he first acquired stations in Fort Wayne. He was here a lot. Uh, now that he has a management team in place that he trusts, he doesn't come by very often, which is, you know, we'd like to see him. But when the CEO doesn't feel that he has to come and visit you every other month, that's actually a good thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's okay. Now, JJ, I'm glad we're establishing this stuff about the business yeah. of radio. Because it is a business. And the business, really, of music, which yes. is really what you're doing over there. It's, it's music and so much more, but music is the heart of it. Yes. And so... Music is the draw. Right. Mm -hmm. And In so radio. there's... People take it very personally. Of course they do. And one of the reasons we're even here talking now has to do with the death of Prince. Yes. And so I'll just kind of outline how, how it played out for Okay. Me. All right. All right. Now, of course, I'm a big Prince fan. Yes. I've been ever since um, I Want to Be Your Lover, his mm -hmm. first album, you know, when he's riding on a unicorn or something yeah. oh, yeah. naked. I, I jumped on the bandwagon in 1984. Okay. Mm -hmm. So old school bands. Mm -hmm. But the last album I bought by Prince was the Gold Experience, okay. like with Endorphin Machine, I think the most beautiful girl in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I did buy his coffee table book with Indigo Nights oh, in it. Oh, cool, man. I did get that, but nonetheless... The, the last thing that I bought was the Black Album, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, I noticed on your Facebook page, after Prince had died, yeah. you had a lot of posts on there about Prince. We did put up a lot of stuff about Prince, yeah. And so then, you know, my thing was like, okay, J.J. is digging Prince, mm. but Rock 104, or... 96.3, XKE, not playing Prince, not thumping this guy. Not regularly, that's and correct. And so I'm wondering, are these guys playing Prince? So mm -hmm. I called the station, talked yeah. to your reception. So yeah. I asked, well, you guys playing Prince? She says, yes. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, why? She says, because he died. I said, well, 
how come this guy has to die to right. get some some airplay over there? Well, that's when she puts me through to you. Yeah. And then we're able to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Now, you let me know that you're playing Purple Rain. Sure. Because, I guess, back in the day, that crossed over. It did cross over to, rock to mainstream rock. rock. That's correct. Now, to me, when I hear that, mm -hmm. it's like, well, here's another black artist yeah. that has to cross over an artificial barrier to be considered rock and roll. Sure. And so... Now, I know with, with XKE and classic rock, that's all in a day's work. It's yeah. just the way it is. Now, with a guy like me, you know, having published Hijinks Magazine from 1989 to 94, dealing with all these mainly rock rock it bands. Wasn't... And so you know that I know this rock and roll stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And even as a black guy back then in the rock scene, uh, well, I was always looked at as out of place. I understand. People usually just couldn't understand. No, dude, it, it was always that way. Like, like mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, just speak, we're speaking openly here sure. about this stuff. Um, I think that the phrase that you would hear, like for, for a band, and we talked about this on the phone a little bit, like, like living color, right? Mm -hmm. And you would hear people say, wow, these guys are good for black dudes in rock. You know what I mean? It was like a surprise because we were so not used to seeing them. And I think that that has a lot to do with the fact, and I know that you know you want to get into a little bit about you know appropriation of black music no, in the fifties no, and sixties. Not so much that. But, well, not because, appropriation. Yeah, but I think that that's a valid point, and I think that that's a part of this discussion because I, we both know that there was a point in time in this country when record executives would not release black music for white audiences. Right. And so what they would do is they would give these songs to these white bands like that, were, yeah, that were written by you know, these black artists, yes. and then they would release them for, for white artists. And that was the time when there was white radio mm -hmm. and black radio. Yeah. And that was that whole idea of separate but equal and all that stuff, which I mean, supposedly was knocked out in 54. That's what the Supreme Court ruled against that. They said you can't do separate but equal anymore. But obviously it stuck around for long, obviously. You know, and, you know, we, and we still would deal with that stuff today, I think. Um, but that was the genesis of all of this. And I think that had the climate, the racial climate been different in the United States in the 1950s, and audiences at that time, if they had been given the opportunity to listen to the original artists, mm -hmm. you know, because you got to remember, man, this stuff wasn't on the internet. It wasn't easily accessible. You couldn't walk down to, to your five and dime store and buy these records, you know. You had to go across the tracks. You had to go to the, you know, the black record store to buy these records. And that's what the, you know, quote unquote hip dudes were doing, right? They were, they were going out and doing that stuff. And that's where, you know, like bands like the Rolling Stones, who found all Almost all of their influence in black artists, almost all of it, you know, they were the cool guys that were going out and buying these records. And then they were taking that music and they were turning, you know, white people on to the black sound, you know what I mean? And that's, I think that's how all of that stuff started. And I don't think that it broke down quick enough, you know? I think it's, and I think there's still a little bit of that today. Now, now if you look at what's super popular now, and classic rock is not the lifeblood of the music industry, obviously. Now, those artists, classic rock artists, still sell a ton of records. Sure. They do, but that's not what's on the top 40 charts, right? And I think that, you know, since the 80s and Michael Jackson, uh, you know, African Americans, black people have been at the top of the top 40 charts for a long time now and, and remain there to this day, you know what I mean? So it's a different landscape now than what it used to be. Um, I don't think the music's all that great. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, but that's just my personal taste. You sure. know what I mean? But I think that landscape has changed a lot. You know, and now you're still going to have appropriation. You're still going to have white dudes that are out there trying to do what black dudes do, and that's never going to change. It's always been that way, and I think it will continue to be that way. But now, at least, I think that uh, black artists are getting their due. You know, it had been for a long time now. That doesn't mean that I'm saying that racism is out of the music industry, because I don't believe that's true. I think it still exists. I'm just saying that, you know, if you look at the, the top selling records that are out there and who's making the most money, you know, it's the rap guys. I mean, like, with music, nowadays it, it's, it doesn't even seem so much racial as much it is just about segregation. The just sound these, of it, man? Because, like, when I grew up, I used to listen to, like, WLYV. I think they used to be a rock station. In the early 70s, what? yes. And yeah. so I remember hearing James Brown, yeah. Queen, 
uh, all together. Led Zeppelin just all of this stuff lumped together. Now, LYV is also is doing that same format now. Okay. If you tune into 1450, you're going to hear those records, and it's all back to back. And so it's so odd to see now, especially the way with it is with streaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really want everything in a very clear category. You're right about that, and that's what happened with uh, just the advent of radio formats, and that came on more or less in the 70s, right? Where you went away from the full service radio stations, radio stations where you know you would wake up and you get the farm report at 6:15, and they would be talking about all the you know, local community events or whatever, and then eventually during the day, all of a sudden they'd start playing some some music records and stuff like that. Um, but it, but it was all sorts of different stuff pulled together. Like if you talk to Doc West, who you know is at XKE and has been for 36 years now, about his beginnings in radio, he used to work at WCOL in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. And they were an AOR radio station, which AOR means Album Oriented Rock. That's what that stands for. And things were much looser at that time, where the DJ was the guy who picked the music, you know what I mean? And he would go in with his records, and he'd bring his own records in a lot of times, and they'd be able to play just whatever the heck they wanted to play. And there was far less musical segregation at that time because it wasn't a format that put up those barriers you know it wasn't a streamlined format but now when you're looking at radio stations that have you know, maybe your choices are almost infinite you know what I mean you go on to internet radio stations satellite radio and I mean obviously you know satellite radio is 200 channels a very specific format but then what we're finding just like uh, just like Ron Stone says mm -hmm. Our industry has done an amazing job of eliminating tenure. Right. And so, is radio advancing or is it regressing? You know, I, I, it's it's not it's not what it used to be. That's for sure. It's a different animal. You know. And I think that what radio does, and you know, a, a lot of forms of media in the internet age, is that we have to try to find our way to survive. How do we survive? And how do you bring the most amount of ears to your radio station, right? Mm -hmm. And so at that point, you sort of have to pick what your target is, mm -hmm. and you have to super serve that target. So you're like, okay, you know, in my mind, I've got a picture of a 44-year-old dude who likes rock, rock music that he grew up listening to, you know what I mean? And that's the stuff that we play on XKE. You know, it's basically, at this point in my life, I'm playing stuff for me. I am the target of that radio station. Now we have other radio stations that play, you know, you know, top forty, for example, you know, and the target of that radio station was completely different. And so we're playing, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, records that reach that particular artist, and it's all about delivering those ears to the advertisers who want to give the advertising messages to that, those people. That's just what the industry is. Now it's been that way for a long time, sure. Okay, but you have to remember, in the days where these radio stations were full serve and doing everything for everybody. There were two radio stations in town. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's what the difference is. There weren't these multitudes of options where you could just assume that people are going to be tuning in because there's nothing else to listen to.